Welcome and thanks for coming tonight. Um, this is a great turnout. We really appreciate you coming to Harborview. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk for about half an hour, sort of do some background um, on fitness and on the topic of universal fitness, not um, fitness maybe as you normally think of it. And then we're going to have individuals talk about their experiences with exercise. And those are going to be Eric Bryant, Kirk Hennig, and Todd Stavelfeld. So, um, and also if there's time at the end of the program, we're going to show you parts of a video that is produced by the National Center on Physical Activity and Disability. How many have you heard of Nick Cat? No? Okay. Well, that, that is a great um, center. It's at University of Illinois. Um, go to their website and they have uh, instructions for exercise for people with spinal cord injury, all sorts of disabilities. And Sigrid, they also have a questionnaire for accessibility of uh, fitness facilities that is available for people to, to use, so you might really want to check Oh, thank you. Okay, a couple of comments before I get started. I'm going to be showing some slides that have uh, photos of equipment or supplies, and I'm trying to remove the brand and the trade names, and I'm not supporting any specific brand or trade name, and I just want you to know that ahead of time. Um, also, I'm going to use the terms tetraplegic and quadriplegic interchangeably. Um, hopefully that's not confusing to anybody, but I had to put up with both during my career, so I figured why not. <laughs> so when we planned this forum, we wanted to present a broader picture of fitness than simply exercise or sports. It's not that those things are not important, because they are, and we will discuss them, but the concept of fitness is broader. To become more fit requires knowing how you positively can affect your health and well-being by using your own capabilities to their best advantage. This means that fitness is universal and that everyone, no matter what the level or completeness of spinal cord injury, can become more fit by choosing to live in a way that will promote health and well-being. So tonight, I will talk about fitness issues and options for becoming more fit, including ways to improve your well-being when you have a higher level of injury. This will be a fast overview of a lot of information, and I won't cover things in great depth so that we can get onto the personal descriptions. But if you do have questions along the way, feel free to interrupt and we'll answer the questions, but try to keep the discussion to a minimum until the end. Um, if you're not already in pursuit of fitness, we hope that by the end of the evening, you'll be ready to get started. Okay. okay. So now that I've finished telling you that tonight is, just, is not just about exercise, I'm going to back up a bit and tell you about the research on exercise benefits and spinal cord injury. And I don't think this is probably new information to anybody, but um, it's important to review it. There is now quite a bit of research that shows that exercise improves health in people with spinal cord injury. And this slide lists the most substantiated or the most well-supported benefits. Um, regular exercisers are more able to perform daily activities, have fewer risks for heart disease, feel better about themselves, and have fewer complications related to spinal cord injury. The benefits on this slide um, have been well supported in many general population studies. And you've probably heard more than you ever want to about the importance of physical activity for everyone. There are also a few small studies in spinal cord injury that support the effectiveness of regular activity or exercise to slow bone loss, improve immune function, prevent diabetes, improve GI motility, and lower the risk of heart disease, high blood pressure, and colon cancer. Though the studies have been done focusing on exercise, which is exercise as you know it, it's planned, structured, you do it for the purpose of becoming more fit, we know that all physical activity provides health benefits. So it's not just the exercise sessions that you do or the sports that you play, but it's your total activity level that makes a difference. Your body benefits from just getting out of bed, especially if you're not inclined to do so. What counts as exercise for the individual varies depending on the amount of active muscle. Spinal cord injury can affect the physiologic response to exercise. Blood is more likely to pool in the legs, and combined with other changes in the sympathetic nervous system, it can cause low blood pressure during or right after exercise. 
um, this is especially true if you're doing really vigorous exercise. Not everyone will experience it, and for those who do, the problem usually can be solved by keeping exercises to moderate intensity by wearing support hose, um, ACE straps, or an abdominal binder. And if there, it's really a problem, um, there are medications that your healthcare provider can prescribe. So don't, um, the hypotension should not be a barrier to exercise, but just be something you should work on. People with an injury at T6 or above are less able to increase their pulse in response to exercise. So a maximal heart rate for someone with quadriplegia might be as low as 120 or 130. Because of this um, variability in heart rate, we emphasize using, um, instead of the heart rate to measure how intense your exercise is, using something called the rate, rating of perceived exertion. And I will show you that scale in a while. Regulation of body temperature is dependent on how much of the body is above the level of injury since sweating and other mechanisms of temperature control rely on the autonomic nervous regulation. For quads, the temperature of the external environment will be the major determinant of body temperature during exercise. So exercising in a cool place, frequently hydrating, and being prepared with a spray bottle and a fan can help prevent any body temperature increase. The other concerns listed on this slide are important considerations if, if you're just about to begin to exercise, some things to think ahead of time. Shoulder and arm pain can often actually be improved with appropriate regular exercise. But if you already have significant pain or a known upper extremity overuse condition, you should begin your program under the guidance of a PT who is knowledgeable in these problems. Pressure sores or abrasions can be caused by improper positioning for the exercise activity or lack of cushioning. It's important to do a complete skin check when you first start a new activity and make adjustments as needed. Autonomic dysreflexia is actually not all that common during exercise, but if you're prone to it and you choose an activity that's irritating to your skin or if your bowel and bladder are not empty, it could be a problem. Spasticity, which is high muscle tone and hyperactive stretch reflexes, may be made worse by some types of exercise. If you stretch the spastic muscle groups before exercise and avoid the exercises that tend to exacerbate or cause the spasms, that may be helpful. Individuals with spinal hardware or effusion should be cleared for all activities or understand what specific restrictions they have provided by the spinal surgeon. That's especially true for people who are newly injured and have new spinal fusions or recent surgeries. Medications can change the way your body responds to exercise. Most common medications taken by people with SCI like Baclofen and other medications uh, for spasticity, the bladder medications and bowel medications are not going to cause any difficulty. But if you're on medication for high blood pressure or breathing problems, you should definitely check with your health care provider before you start exercising. So I'm sure this slide is going to be a review for most of you. The three components of a traditional exercise program are aerobic exercise, muscle strength and endurance, and stretching or flexibility. Cardiovascular conditioning is essential for maintaining a healthy heart muscle and for having the endurance to meet daily activity needs. Muscular strength is important for lifting weight and maintaining the balance between muscle groups. Muscle endurance is ability to lift mild to moderate weight many times. This allows you to perform a pattern of movement for an extended period of time. Exercises like wheelchair pushing or arm ergometry provide both cardiovascular conditioning and improve muscle endurance. Flexibility is important to preserve good motion at the joints and stretching or range of motion exercises to maintain flexibility. No matter what is your level or completeness of injury, flexibility exercise should be part of your program. Strengthening any working muscle is also important. Aerobic exercise is more difficult with a higher level injury, but don't completely rule it out. I read one case study of an individual with C4 level injury who was able to increase heart rate doing shoulder shrugging alone. FES exercise is another option. Physical activity does not have to be strenuous to provide health benefits. 
Moderate activity, 30 minutes or more daily on most days of the week, is a good goal for everyone. Aerobic exercise requires continuous and rhythmical motion. Cardiovascular fitness cannot be gained in a hurry, and it requires starting slowly with very slow and gradual increases in exercise intensity over a long period of time. The principle of overload applies to aerobic training. You have to work at a level of intensity that's more than that required for daily life in order to become more fit. This doesn't mean exercising strenuously, but doing moderate intensity activity for gradually longer periods of time. Fitness gains without injury are more likely if the duration and frequency are gradually increased, but the intensity is kept at the moderate level. An alternative to using the heart rate to measure exercise intensity is the rating of perceived exertion, or RPE. The numbers on the left correspond with the levels of effort described at the right. <laughs> Ideally, you want to stay between level 3 and 4 when you're working out cardiovascularly. It may take a few exercise sessions before you get a feeling for knowing how hard you're working and knowing the right amount to adjust the exercise routine to increase or decrease intensity. Another way to gauge intensity is that with light intensity, you should be able to sing while you exercise. With moderate intensity, you can talk with someone else while you exercise, but with vigorous or hard intensity, you can't carry on a conversation. So this slide lists some of the options for aerobic activity available for people with lower extremity paralysis. People with incomplete injuries with some leg movement will have additional options. It's a good idea to have more than one choice for aerobic activity, if at all possible, because varying activities decreases your chance of injury and usually makes exercise more enjoyable. It also gives you a contingency plan for good days, bad days, high pain days, high uh, stress days, so that you have choices to fit all of those different conditions. It's also true that if you're using a wheelchair pushing for, exer for exercise, um, you definitely want to have alternatives because you're already doing probably a lot of wheelchair pushing, and you want to avoid doing too much of the same thing. Independent exercise programs are possible for people with C5-6 quadriplegia using an arm ergometer with pedal adapters or doing wheelchair endurance runs or wheelchair aerobics. Other options may require assistance from others. Can any of you think of things that are left off this slide? Things that you're doing that, that I've forgotten? Or any comments about any of those? These are examples of some of the types of equipment that can be purchased or that you can ask or beg or harass your local gym to purchase so that they can be widely available for lots of people. The prices and quality vary. Circuit training involves cycling through weightlifting and aerobic exercise, and it's kind of hard to see this picture, but it's an example of a, a circuit training setup in a gym. Um, such a program can sustain heart rate and blood pressure so that aerobic benefits can be achieved without steady aerobic activity. Circuit training can also be done at home by setting up an area with strength training equipment and space to do an aerobic activity in, in between intervals of weightlifting. This can be done for as little as $50 or less using elastic bands hooked to a door or wall and doing arm circling for the aerobic intervals. And of course there are all the sports and recreational activities that are usually presented at this forum. And there are also lots of ways to increase your cardiovascular endurance by doing your daily activities in a rhythmic manner and maintaining the effort for at least 10 minute sessions. This first step here is doing gardening. And if you do any activity like that for at least 10 minutes at a time, that will give you fitness benefits. So that's always the goal. 10 minute sessions at least three times a day. Electrical stimulation of paralyzed or partially paralyzed muscles causes muscle contractions that with training can provide functional movement of the limbs. These repetitive motions of the limbs can provide cardiovascular and muscular muscle endurance training. <coughs> FES technology works only for people with spastic muscles. In other words, those with an injury above the T12 level, or, uh, approximately that level. 
People with cardiac pacemakers cannot use FES due to the potential for electrical interference with the pacemaker. And other things that can, success, or that can interfere with successful FES exercise are joint contractures, autonomic dysreflexia, which could, for some people, actually be caused by E-STEM, and also um, having good sensation because E-STEM can be painful for some people. FES exercise can provide many benefits, including improvements in cardiac output, circulation, decreased spasticity, and that feel-good-after-exercise feeling from, from release of endorphins. Electrically stimulated muscles grow larger and reverse some of the post-injury atrophy. So there's no doubt about it, FES can be a good way to exercise if you have FES, if you have spinal cord injury, but it's not available for everyone and can't be used by everyone. Um, and in the next section, Eric will be talking about his uh, experiences with FES exercise. Can I ask a question, Ben? Yeah. Is that the machine you see on like the home shopping network? What is that, FES? Yeah, the, the one that does the abdominals, you know, yeah. where you're lying in bed? No, that's not that one. That's not that one. Um, that doesn't provide, the, these are the machines for the FES exercise, so you can get the full um, limb movement. I got you. Okay. Um, these are represented the three main types. Can I ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. If you have a back with a pump, which really makes you atrophy, and you work out, can you gain muscle by a fabric on upper body and parts of it are paralyzed and I have a back with a pump? Can it, can it strengthen it or tone it or no? Can it strengthen it in your, your arms? Um, yeah, like from, oh. yeah, uh -huh. even yeah. like with a back with a pump. Yeah, yeah. Thing? yeah. That, that doesn't stop you from gaining those training benefits, definitely. So the picture up in the, the left-hand corner is FES rowing, which isn't really available in this country yet, but it's, it's under research development in the UK. And the photo here shows, um, shows them using volitional, you know, volitional arm movements, and then they're having FES stimulation of their legs to uh, offer the resistance to that movement. The two ergometers or cycles down here on the bottom are actually the two that are approved for commercial use now in the US. Um, and what they do is they, the surface electrodes are, are programmed in a sequence to provide this crankshaft rotation, so it's like a uh, cycling motion. And uh, these, are, these can be used at home. There's also a, a unit that can be purchased for uh, gyms. Is there one here? I don't know if there's one. There's one at UW, and uh, I don't know if we have one. Oh. Nope. And this is the this is an FES standing or ambulation system. Um, all of the walking systems use walkers or parallel bars or elbow crutches for balance and support. And the physical effort of FES assisted ambulation is six to eight times that of able-bodied walking, so that walking speeds and distances covered are generally low. Muscle strength training principles are universal. Um, you need to use lighter loads when beginning a weight training program in order to master the technique. And find a weight or level of resistance that causes your muscles to fatigue after 10 to 15 repetitions. If you're able to do more than 15, then the weight's too light. And if you can't reach 10, then the weight or the resistance is too heavy. You shouldn't work the same muscle group every day. So alternating days, rest days with weight training days is a good idea. And Kirk's going to be talking about his weight training program after this. So it's a good idea if you plan a new program, a new weight training program, that you started out in consultation with a PT or a personal trainer um, so that you can learn proper technique. Because if you learn to do it right um, at the beginning, you're going to get better benefits from it and, and definitely decrease your chance of injury. Many people with spinal cord injury, especially those that are wheeling manual wheelchairs, develop muscle tightness in the front of the shoulder due to wheelchair pushing. The muscles in the front become shorter and stronger while the opposing muscles in the posterior shoulder and upper back uh, become longer and weaker. So the imbalance is one of the major contributors to shoulder injury and pain. Weak trunk muscles and inappropriate wheelchair seating support can lead to poor sitting posture typically the hunching forward with rounded shoulders type of posture. And this type of posture 
can worsen shoulder pain. Good transfer technique and wheelchair pushing mechanics are also important. Doing a lot of overhead reaching will put stress on the shoulders that can cause injury and pain. Sleeping postures, especially lying directly on top of your shoulders if you have quadriplegia, can also hurt your shoulders. If you already have shoulder pain, you should take some time to change your habits and adapt your daily activities and modify your environment. The goal is to make your movement pain-free, but not to stop moving. Exercises like rowing or poles, pole wheeling, which is actually using a pole to push your chair instead of the wheels, or wheeling backward, strengthening the back and the posterior shoulder muscles and stretch the, the front of the shoulders and can be especially helpful. Strengthening exercise options include free weights, wall weights, and exercise machines that might require you to go to a gym or to set up an exercise area in your own house and purchase expensive equipment on your own. Exercise elastic bands and tubing are an effective, low-cost resistance training method, and they can provide varying degrees of resistance that can be done almost anywhere. Again, you can also get stronger by making your daily activities a little more difficult, and even by doing some things for yourself that you would normally ask someone else to do. These are examples of strength training equipment that can be used by people with injury levels as high as C5, although it's, it's, sometimes you can't do all of the exercises um, that are available um, on a specific machine. Ideally, you should try the pieces of equipment before you think of buying them, and preferably with a PT available uh, to determine if it's appropriate for you, or take a picture to your PT and uh, uh, discuss whether it's appropriate or not. Prices for these types of machines vary from $400 up to $2,500, but you might be able to get a really good, good deal on eBay or Craigslist from somebody who doesn't use their selling them. These are low-tech, affordable options for strength training. Elastic bands and tubing can be used for a variety of exercises in a variety of situations. Both bands and tubings can be purchased with handles, and there's pictures of some of the handles down there, that provide a way for those with decreased hand function to use them. They can also be fastened to wheelchairs or doors with loops or the clip-on system, and that's a clip-on system up there. Um, pictured on this slide. And if people get really creative, they can tie them in different ways and fasten them to various places. Um, it's also possible to carry a band with you so you have an instant exercise program to perform during those times when you're waiting for a ride or uh, feeling like you need an activity break in your day. Um, in one research study that I did a couple of years ago, one of my favorite participants took his exercise band with him on the bus hooked it up to one of the bars on the bus, it did a complete routine while he was commuting for an hour, rolled off the bus and went to school. Activity mis mitts and wrist cuffs um, can be used to grip weight machines or dumbbells if hand function is limited. Cup weights can be used for a variety of exercises. And those are up here and there's a whole stack of them right here. Um, for those who have difficulty with balance and stability, straps and gate belts can aid in proper positioning in a wheelchair. Everyone needs to stretch, and people who have little ability to move need to be stretched regularly and gently. If the available joint range is limited, gradual stretching may be achieved over several weeks of low intensity work. Caregivers should be taught how to do range of motion, but don't assume that once they're taught, they're good to go and you no longer have to pay attention. It's your body and you need to know its limits and requirements and keep track of what your caregivers are doing. Range of motion is a series of exercises in which the joints of their extremities are moved within their capacity. Depending on the level of function, some or total assistance may be required. Range of motion is best carried out while lying on a firm surface like a mat table, but it can also be done in bed or a modified version done sitting in a wheelchair. In the lower right-hand corner of the slide, there's an example of um, an online video for instructing caregivers in range of motion. And on the handouts that are in the back of the room, I put this um, 
website address because it's a really handy thing if you're, you're training caregivers on a regular basis just to have them go to the website and look at it or, or use it as a, a way of teaching them. Um, wheelchair yoga, which is pictured in the middle, is designed to involve caregivers if necessary and is usually done in a group setting. And depending on individual needs, yoga can be practiced in many different positions sitting, standing, or lying on the floor or on a mat. Poses can be modified and props like blocks, sandbags, blankets, and pillows can be used to support posture. Resistance to postures due to spasticity is often encountered, but the resistance decreases as the posture is assumed and is well supported. The eventual stretch or elongation of the muscle props a release and the body accepts a relaxed pose. Now I know there was something on the uh, the woman's list the other day about having an, a yoga instructor come. Does somebody know about a local instructor that does this? I looked. I, I looked online and tried to find someone. So I think it's what needs to be done is the is you need to talk to people who are teaching it. It's a very easy thing to adapt. Yes. The samurai center offers yoga. Did you hear that? The, the, the samurai center. center? Central District. Thank you, Doug. You're welcome. Adaptive Pilates, which is pictured here, uh, combines stretch and flexibility using specific exercises that involve concentration, control, and movement, and coordinated breathing. It often fo focuses on core muscles, but it doesn't have to focus on core muscles. And it can be especially helpful for shoulder and neck muscles. Um, and again, I don't know of any adaptive Pilates centers either. Do you know? Yeah, okay. But I think it's time that we, we start asking for these things. Um, we know that they exist. Online you can find them existing in various parts of the country, so it's just time to, to get it here. Watsu was pictured here. Um, it's a therapy that involves being floated and stretched in the arms of another person in warm water. Um, there is a local Watsu therapist that I saw. Um, it was advertised at $125 a session, though, which I think is kind of steep. Um, but it sounds like it might be really relaxing, and uh, it's supposed yeah, to reduce Kind of like a massage. It's expensive. It feels good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 People with even very high injury levels can improve fitness by doing breathing exercises. Breathing is significantly impaired in quadriplegia because of paralysis of the intercostal, intercostal, that's the rib muscles, and abdominal muscles, and reduced movement of the diaphragm. There are also varying degrees of breathing problems in people with thoracic or T-level injuries due to paralysis of the abdominal muscles. The weakness of those muscles affects lung volumes, cough capacity, and the ability to keep breathing strenuously over time. In long-term spinal cord injury, the rib cage compartment actually may get stiff due to a combination of spasticity from not getting frequent good deep breaths and um, oh, a combination, sorry, of spasticity and repetitive amount of time of not getting good deep breaths to stretch it. The muscles of inspiration are breathing in, are the, inter, are the external intercostals, which elevate the ribs and increase the width of the chest, and then the diaphragm, which lengthens the chest. So when those muscles work, that creates a negative air space and, and inspiration occurs and air rushes into your lungs. Expiration normally is just a passive sort of process, but when the expiratory muscles become really important is when you need to cough or mobilize secretions. Yeah, Todd knows about that. Um, so the mus in quadriplegia, the accessory muscles of inspiration become prime movers. And those are the muscles that raise the sternum and the upper part of the chest, the sternocleidomastoid and the scalene muscles. Um, so what happens is the upper part of the rib cage opens only, and so there's a, you get a lot of shallow breaths, but you don't get those deep um, breaths. Reliance on accessory muscles along with resistance from having weak inspiratory muscles creates very inefficient breathing that can lead to fatigue. Okay. 
there are two main types of respiratory muscle training. There's inspiratory and expiratory muscle training. People with SCI at a cervical level have weakness of both inspiratory and expiratory muscles and can benefit from both types of training, while those with thoracic level injuries may have more difficulty with expiratory muscles. Breathing exercises may be beneficial in sustaining healthy lung capacity. Establishing a breathing program of ventilatory muscle training can be part of a daily workout plan and probably should be for those with injury levels above at T6. A recent systematic review concluded that respiratory muscle training is helpful for increasing expiratory muscle strength and vital capacity, but it couldn't determine for certain if it was effective for improving inspiratory muscle strength, muscle endurance, and respiratory complications. More research is required to fully understand the possible benefits. But meanwhile, I think there's enough support that most people with SCI, SCI should consider respiratory fitness options. Uh, we always used to recommend incentive spirometers to encourage deep breaths. And you know, you probably all remember those on the bedside stand and nurses sticking them in your face saying, take some deep breath. Um, but in reality, they probably don't do a lot to strengthen weak muscles. And they're probably, for a home program, they're, they're not very efficient at all. Um, because they don't offer any resistance to your inspiration, your, your deep breath. There's some new respiratory muscle devices springing up on the market. Um, many are aimed at singers or marathon runners to gain respiratory efficiency. They offer variable resistance to inspiration or expiration, and they've been shown to improve respiratory effort and coordination. But there are several options that are much more fun. Yoga, which we've already discussed as a flexibility exercise, has a major focus on breathing and breath work. Singing requires learning how to sustain certain notes for a considerable period of time and to attempt to control the amount of air necessary to complete a line of lyrics. These skills are likely to benefit respiratory health with people in SCI. Besides the breath control exercise, singing can be enjoyable, give you personal satisfaction and emotional release, and you don't even have to be good at it. Laughter has also been found to improve the efficiency of the respiratory system and has been called internal jogging for the major organs. Laughter clubs incorporate breathing, yoga, and laughter in their regular activities, and they're a heck of a lot of fun. Other benefits of laughter that have been confirmed by research include positive psychological benefits, including increased pain tolerance and improved circulation. GPV, which is the pronounceable term for glossopharyngeal breathing, um, is a technique for ventilating the lungs unaided by the muscles of respiration. Air is forced into the lungs by the tongue, neck, and mouth muscles. This is a great technique for someone who's ventilator dependent because it can take the place of vent-assisted respiration for a short period of time um, if there are problems with the ventilator. It's also a great technique for people with higher level of injuries because it maximally inflates the lungs. Unfortunately, I can't teach you to do this. It's really a difficult thing. I'm sure there's somebody out there who can. Um, and the respiratory therapist at, at the U can you know, help you with that. Kathy, what are blow darts? Oh, blow darts. Blow darts are actually just a recreational activity um, where you, mm. for quads, who can actually um, Blow, you know, aim the dart at a target and uh, blow like a blow gun. So it's a blow dart, okay. It's like a blow dart. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here are some of the options I discussed. And sorry about the, the bad photography. Um, the device that's on the top right is the one that was used in the best study in spinal cord injury for um, expiratory muscle training. And uh, it is available currently. And I don't know of anybody using it locally right now in spinal cord injury, but it's something that I'd be interested in investigating and, and learning more about. Um, I would also love to do a study of singing. This particular group is called Van Gogh, and they don't have spinal cord injury, but they both have muscular dystrophy, which causes similar weakness of the uh, breathing muscles. Todd's going to demonstrate a vocal technique that, that uh, helps with respiratory health. So in recent years, aggressive physical rehab programs have emerged that seem to restore function in some people with SCI even years after injury. 
And there are several theories as to how this will work, but they were all covered in the uh, Spinal Cord Forum on um, uh, the Cure Theory, so I'm not, I don't really have time to go into that today. But um, there, there is scientific support for effectiveness in the very incomplete injuries. There's also still a lot of need for research in this area. Programs are usually either private clinics or university-based, and then, and because of that, the agendas and priorities vary. University programs are often research-driven with the goal of publishing papers and getting grant awards, and private clinics are often focused on providing real-world results and economically sustaining the program. And obviously these are generalities and specific programs vary, and I think across the country there's a wide variety. Um, in my opinion, I hope that someday there will be affordable options, including home-based programs, to allow folks who want to spend the time and effort to participate. It's also important that activity-based therapies do not become the only life focus while relationships, career, and family life are put on hold. So you're not going to kill me? Um, so I hope that part of what you learned tonight is that no matter what is your injury level and functional abilities, there are ways for you to increase your fitness. This slide lists some of the questions you want to ask yourself if you're planning to begin an exercise program, increasing your general activity or just trying a new activity to increase your fitness. Starting with a personal assessment will help you figure out if you can just make the change or whether you need to see your health care provider or a PT before you begin. No matter what type of fitness you desire to work on, goal setting is an important tool to map out an effective strategy for getting where you want to be. It's important to set realistic goals that can be met within a reasonable time. Most importantly, if you're not currently as fit as you'd like to be, it's time to get started. Schedule your new activity or exercise to fit into your day or week. Make it your priority rather than something you might do if you have time for it. And before you actually start making it your priority, think about timing. Is this the right time in your life to make the change? Because you want it to be the, the best time possible so that, that you'll be able to uh, start make, uh, creating a new habit. Activities. So I've shown you quite a few options tonight, but I want you should think about what you can do, what you like to do, and what you're brave enough to try, and then create a menu of options. And not just one or two things, but probably three or four is a good idea. Resources. Do you need help, equipment, or encouragement, and how are you going to get that? Whatever it is that motivates you to exercise is a good reason. Once you get started, uh, keep track, record what you do, and create benchmark goals, and reward yourself as you meet them. So that's the end of my presentation tonight. Um, are there any questions? Okay. So now I'd like to, we're going to hear from the, the three people uh, with quadriplegia who are successfully promoting their own fitness. And first I'd like to introduce to you Eric Bryant. And Eric's going to talk to you about FES cycling. We want to. Um, how about over there? Can everybody see Eric? Yeah. 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 That must yeah. have been the outgoing Miss Washington. Do you want me to change your point? Ah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, you just tell me when you want to talk for a while. So, pretty much the same thing. Um, yeah, I, I have my own FBS. It's the urges. Um, talk a little louder. A little bit louder. Okay. Um, I attained it about uh, 16 years ago. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get it through my uh, insurance company. Wow. Oh, and, um, yeah, it was a lot of work, but I got to do it. And, um, you know, so I've been riding it for about 16 years. Um, I ride it uh, about four days a week, uh, 30 minutes a day. Um, so it's, it's a commitment, but it's, it's definitely worth it. Um, it takes me about an hour to get on and off of it, I'd say. Um, you know, it's got, it basically, I think it's like an exercise bike, but it's, it's a lot more than just that. I mean, it's huge benefits to it that I've noticed through 16 years of doing it. Um, just basically, you know, right off the bat, I've noticed a huge amount of increased um, range of motion. Um, my circulation um, is 
been great. My legs. Um, I've never had a problem with, with uh, really any kind of skin breakdown um, with it. Um, uh, See, so, you know, I've got uh, really haven't noticed any kind of problem with spasticity in my legs. Um, my cardiovascular system has been really built from it as well. Um, I've noticed I've had a lot more endurance with pushing and uh, just doing everything, just day to life type of stuff. I don't get real tired. Uh, I think kind of built up from it. Um, see, my muscle mass in my legs have been pretty well built up from it too. I haven't noticed, I mean, too much atrophy going on in my legs from it. Um, you can actually adjust it so you can do more um, uh, tension on it to kind of give it stimulate so you're actually pushing weight with it. So you can kind of gauge how much weight you want to do. And, and as you do that, it also can increase your uh, your you know, your, your heart, you know, feel your heart pumping more if you want to you know, get more out of it. Um, so um, unless that's also help with my immune system, I uh, don't feel like I get sick. Um, uh, really not much. Um, maybe you know, a common cold or something like that once in a while, but um, I haven't really got got anything too extreme since I've been riding and so um, um, really don't get too many UTIs which is awesome um, so it's I think it's definitely helped with that as well um, um, see here it's just overall mentally too I think it's really good for you to, to do it it's just just to physically be able to do that and it just kind of helps you out I think getting up and doing something like that um, you know, so it's uh, just all around, it's just a lot more than just an exercise bike to me with, with doing it. Um, you know, um, it's giving me a lot higher energy level as well. Um, so, I mean, it's uh, it's definitely a lot more than just than just, just an exercise bike. Um, if you can have access to one, I would definitely recommend trying it and seeing what it can do for you. Um, so. Um, it's just basically what you do is put on, this, it's like a, a cycling pants that I put on. They have electrodes sewn into them. And uh, it, it uh, you know, basically works the, uh, the glutes, uh, the hamstrings, and the quadriceps. To, you know, they all contract in a way to make you pedal the, pedal the bike. Um, you can control the stimulus too on it, so you can increase it. Uh, so it's, you know, to get it to flex more or decrease it so it's a little more comfortable for you. Um, so it's all pretty gaugeable like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's something that, that um, it'd be nice if, if uh, really if all the hospitals around rehab wise would have something in, in the uh, facilities to, to use. I know I did, originally when I started, I did go through the UW and they did have one. They, are, they still do it not. But um, that's why I started using it. Um, so um, it's definitely worth checking into around. I think Overlake Hospital had one as well. Um, the last time I that was probably about uh, 10 years ago. So I think they may be kind of floating around at some places. Um, just kind of to check around and see if you can find them. Um, so, I think there's anything else here. Um, does anybody have any questions? Can you transfer to the back and forth? Because you don't do it in your chair, right? No, I don't. No, you, have, you definitely have to get it out of your chair into it. Um, no, you know, my wife actually helps me get in and out of it. Um, it's, it definitely is a two-person type of setup for sure. Um, I think, you, you know, if you really wanted to do it yourself, you probably could, depending on what your, your level is. But uh, it would take a lot longer than probably than an hour to do it, I think. Um, so it's definitely helpful to have somebody there to help you do it. So the total time from beginning to end is an hour and a half? Uh, for me, it's probably about an hour, I'd say. Okay. Yeah. Well, Have you seen that new step machine? There's one over at the VA uh, inpatient. This arms and legs are the same. Oh yeah, um, I haven't I haven't seen that one, yet. but that's probably a good one for doing the arms as well. We do have one of those down there, so people want to see that. But that doesn't have these. Stem. No, it's not an e stem though. Not what? We have a new step, but it's not an e stem. It's just. What's an e stem? Oh, it's not the FES part of it. That it, you just. You work your legs by work by pumping your arms. What's the stem? It's no electrical stimulation. 
going on is all of your your action moving in yourself with your arms. Oh, so if you're complete, it helps you move your legs. If you're complete, and you need some external stimulation to make them go. Or, or incomplete. Um, some some folks that are incomplete can use these too. Mm -hmm. It's just whether you have the sensation of whether it's uncomfortable to you or not. Mm -hmm. I was just wanting to know what level of injury. Uh, C6. And did, it, did you gain any levels by doing it? Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't, you know, I've, I've been doing it for 16 years, and um, I'd have to say, yeah, I probably have gained something back from that. I mean, I, um, you know, I do feel a lot more stable in my torso, and, you know, I, I, my abdominal muscles and things like that. I think it really has improved that for me. Um, so, yeah, I think so. When you, talk, when you are doing your workout, do you break into a sweat? Or do you ever get over here? I, I don't sweat that much as it is. Um, so, I don't really notice myself sweating. I definitely feel my heart pounding. Um, you definitely get a good cardiovascular workout. You can get winded. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to introduce you, Kirk Hennig, who's going to talk about weightlifting. Hi, I've done weightlifting almost since I was about, I don't know, eight or ten years old. And the only real uh, hiatus I took is when I got injured, I was an inpatient for a period of time here at Harborview, and then transferred over to UW. And you know, post injury, there was a short period of time, and then they had me back to lifting weights. Uh, the big difference was that while I was lifting weights, when I got injured, I was about 150 pounds, 152, and I could bench 275. And when I started working out at the UW, I benched about five. <laughs> you know, and so uh, it was very. Uh, emotionally <laughs> distressing, you know, and uh, pretty humbling. But the bright side was that I continued to do it, and I think I have benefited from it. And, and it, I just incorporate it into my daily life. Now, to make it work, I do have a C5 compression injury. I have C6 incomplete function. I have some sensory in my legs. I have classic biceps and wrist extension, no triceps. A lot in my anterior shoulders. I should have posterior, but I fail at many of the things that Kathy said. Don't do these things, you know. And so I work the bench because that's easy, and I do things like push forward because that's what I need to do. I don't like going backwards. And and, uh, and I did have, and I looked around, you know, I heard her speak. I did have a wall system that's still out in my garage, but it requires somebody to tie me to it. And then usually they would leave, and I'd be out there working out, working out. And one day I got a spasm on my side, and went ah ah ah, and I laid there kind of hanging for about a half an hour. So this isn't too safe, and, and then you know got a spasm another way, sat up. But anyway, no, I think it's great to do it. I need to incorporate that. I didn't take any slides of what I do for my back. Uh, this is all going to be just my normal routine, and I do this every day, the same weights, so. <laughs> I'm not resting the muscle groups, but let's see if we can do it. So, who knows? Maybe that's me getting a call. Rescue me right now. So the bench press I do every day, and I do them while I'm laying on my back, while my legs are being ranged, passive range of motion, and the tenant straps on like 15-pound weights. And then I usually do three sets of 20. I used to do three sets of 30, and I was getting a little trouble in my left elbow area, and so I backed them down a little bit. The trickiness is like if I'm doing bench up like this, and it's more like this because I don't really get them up here. They go to bend the leg or something. I lose my balance, and you drop like that. And a few times it's too many. So uh, this is where I'm just getting the weights clamped, strapped on. There are these guys right over here. I just what I had when I got discharged from the UW. Now this is back in '83, and I had L and I at the time, and I could get great coverage about exercise equipment, and those sets worked for about 10 years and then they started to wear through and crack and I like a single strap better than I do the doubles. I see some of the heavy ones here have two straps on them but the single works better for me particularly 
the ones I'm going to take off on my own because I can grab them with my teeth and take them off. So I start out, make sure they're on, and it's important for me that they strapped on tight, otherwise they'll slide down around my elbow. And then, so at this, that's about as high as I can come up with them, really. So mostly, I'm working the anterior deltoids. I don't have any pecs at all, to tell you the truth. If you saw, you know, my chest, it doesn't look a whole lot different than some of those off switch shots. You know, it's terrible. It's very badly atrophy. So, and then I just come straight down, but I hold the arms up versus rotating them or anything like that, because I used to, like, rotate them down against the bed and then come back up. And what I find is I get a lot of stress on my elbow. And just back up again. But it has helped me with my anterior deltoids. helps me with to grab something, to pull myself in and out of the car. Or yesterday I was in my shop, my garage actually, and I'm having my house, the piping redone in it, and the side sewer project, and water supply, a lot going on. Some people put a cabinet in front of the place I need to be. And it probably weighs about 60 pounds. And by the time I got done shaking it around and pulling, I got it out of the way. Now, I'm only a C6, but I used ergonomics and I think that strong anterior motion to do that. So, that takes care of my morning routine. While, again, the tenant's doing the range of motion, I do it every day. Uh, I used to do just five pounds. And I built up, those are 15 pound weights I was using there. And then I do a seated set nearly every day. Um, some days get interrupted, like if I'm working on a project or I have an appointment to leave to. But I use cuff weights again, and I have them strapped on first. My failing point is because the person is typically leaving, i got to get everything strapped on to begin with. So I start at my heavy weight, and then I'm taking weight off. Where before, when I trained, I'd start with a light weight, warm up a bit, get the muscles warmed, all that, then build up, go through several sets in several different positions of lifting weights before I top out, and then I'd work back down most times. I just didn't do three sets, I just worked up and then back down for training. Uh, I do curls, forward like this, I do reverse curls, and actually right now the Velcro is wearing out on mine, I have to be real careful, I do them real slow, because if I go fast at all, which is really not as good for the body anyway, uh, doesn't maximize your gain, the Velcro will ba break loose. And that's not so good to get off balance. Uh, I do two sets, like I say. I started out with five pounds after I had bursitis in my right elbow. That was about five years ago. Don't know why. It just swelled up, and I could hardly do transfers for about two months. I went through PT. I had an ultrasound, ice therapy, e-stem, all kinds of great things. And finally, I said, you know, if it goes bad, it goes bad. I'm going to go home and lift weights again because I was atrophying. It's affected my transfers, everything. And so I started to lift, and I built back up from 5 pounds now. My curls are actually up to 25 pounds. And uh, so here I just always, when I get those beige ones, I, then I try to make sure I'm positioned properly. And then that's with both sets on. And so it's not like I just hold them out in my hands, right? I've shortened up that lever arm a little bit. So I worked out every morning before I went to work, before my injury, with 25 pounds. And uh, so I'm at the same weight, but a shorter distance on my arm. I'm not getting the same effect. And you'll see some of my limitations in range here. I start out, looks like I'm asleep there, actually. It says I'm visualizing, but mostly. The other <laughs> but in reality, one of my weaknesses of my routine is that I'm not properly auctionated. Because I, my, my routine runs through, I stand for 15 minutes every day at a standing table. I sit down, I'm completely drained, I run out, the attendant slaps the weights on, says, see ya, have a nice day. And so I either got to take a few moments to rest right then, or what I find is my first set's really hard, man. I'm, whew, am I tired? But about the second set, third set, I start feeling really good. And so... I was trying to do these just without the weights, and, and it's actually good that I took these photos because you'll notice my arms aren't in the best position. Actually, for curls, I should have those palms face up instead of face in like this. I don't know if all of you can see, but rotating them more would be better. And then 
You can see if you lift too much, you get, oh! But, <laughs> no, that's my maximum, no. But I, I got about the same range, truly, really, with 25 pound weights. Uh, I do have a weak right shoulder, and it does, it shows up when I do things like in my maximal lifts like this. And that came actually more prominent after a single myelia I had several years ago. I don't know if everybody knows what that is, but a cyst within your spinal cord that will form about your injury level. And I had some resulting uh, functional loss from that. And then the other one I do is a middle deltoid lift. This is sort of like flies where you come out to the side. And I have noticed benefit for that because particularly if I use lighter weights to begin with, I come up higher in my range. What I notice then, if I position a little more, I can reach up higher and get things out of a shelf you know, or a cabinet, even if I just hook them a little bit and bring them over, where before I didn't have that stability. And I've guided up to like 25 pound boxes down from a shelf you know, and catch them on my lap. So uh, well, I used that briefcase for that. Oh. <laughs> that calculator and I'm hoping to break that sooner or later and buy a new one since 1970. Yeah. Uh, and then you notice the light weights, I'm actually able to go up higher. And so I think there is benefit to using the lighter weights at times, particularly for range. And then uh, the reverse curl, I start out almost like curls. I have to do the lighter weight. I can't do a reverse curl at the same 25 pounds. I've backed off quite a bit here to the 15s. And then I just bring them straight up. And actually maximum, I bring them up clear to my shoulder and then back down again. And a friend of mine, uh, it was actually a ballerina. She told me that, you know, I had to work, and she worked for me for a while, and said, you know, you ought to do your exercises really slow. Test that out for a while. And I tried the difference of what I normally do, and a, and taking them and counting to ten as you come up, hold them, and then ten as you go down. Holy moly! <coughs> and I was burning. Yeah. So lighter weight, I can get just as much functional benefit, frankly, if I did that. Maybe more. And then I just store my weights right on a shelf, you know, because part of this is how do you get these rascals off and where do you put them. And what I do, literally, the straps are a little bit long, and I drag those blue ones off just by laying them on my briefcase and kind of wiggle them and get them off. And sometimes if they're strapped too tight, it's a real son of a gun. But I get those guys off. They're left on my briefcase. And then the others, I wheel myself over real carefully with them still on my lap and grab a hold, hook my arm stable, undo them with my teeth a little ways so they don't drop all together, and then I can lift them up. Over 15 pounds, I'm not sure I could because that shelf's about 6, 8 inches above. You know, it's up about this height. So it's pretty good lift at the end of my exercise. Then I set them up there, and they're there the next day. And it's not the, everything you want in your kitchen, but I don't have a separate exercise room. So. Uh, I think that's the, the key points. For me, is that I know I don't get enough rest to have proper energy. I can feel that a lot of times. Like last night, I got about five hours, and my routine was slower today. Uh, I found that when I eat more protein, I did benefit for building muscle mass, and I did build up the weights gradually. It took me about a year to go from five pounds to 15, and another year to go to 25 on my curls. But I've stayed at that same level now for about three years. Uh, yes? Uh, how much is enough protein for you? For me, I eat about, okay, I want about 125 to 130 pounds. Okay. Oh, I am, weight. I am. That's my weight. And so I eat about, at my low days, is 60 to 70 grams of protein. At the high, is more like 100, 110. Yeah. And I have a, an acquaintance who's a para, who's a builder. You know, a bodybuilder, and he is ripped, and he eats a gram a day for every pound of weight he is, so, uh, which is a lot of protein. But he gets there, yeah. But you know, he's like 165, and and if you think of your calorie intake, he's probably burning 2,500, 3,000 a day. That's not that bad. But uh, you need so, protein for actually making muscle. You do, and for maintaining it, true, too. Otherwise, if you're exercising. Once you burn up the carbohydrates in your body, you're going to start attacking the protein next. So, uh, 
again, if my problem is I don't tend to do them fast, slow enough. I tend to be in a hurry. I want to go and get something else done, leave for something. And that's actually where I run into aches and pains if I'm going too fast. Yeah. And then it turned out when I first started uh, trying to rebuild my right arm after that bursitis in my elbow, I started using ice pack. Immediately afterwards, I just use it for five minutes. And because every day it would swell after I'd work out, I put the ice pack on and it'd go down. And to start with, I was icing it three times a day. Now I just ice it for five minutes after each routine. And actually, I've just started using it on the left arm now. So, uh, and that's it. So I appreciate it. I take any questions you have. But thank you. Yes. One more question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank yeah. you. Where's the best place to get your uh, protein? I actually, for me personally, I use uh, Seattle Super Supplements. Again, I'm not backing them. But no, it's convenient. And actually, I tried several different ones. I tried whey and I tried uh, uh, soy. And I'm actually, what seems to be the best for me, and it's powder protein. Yeah. I, I just mix it in with cereal, frankly. Um, and then I eat yogurts and chicken and fish, but the rice protein is easier for me to digest. Uh, okay, what is the best way to get uh, like a health food store? Uh, Seattle Super Supplements is where I go. Uh, it's like a health food yeah. store, yeah. yeah. But that's okay. the, that is the store itself, okay. which is actually now I go, I think it's just called Super Supplements, right? They All drop right. the Seattle, because they are in eastern Washington, too. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, so, there's, cool. there's stores that change, several stores. Yeah, there's one in the U District, yeah. there's one up north, a couple in the Linwood area. Right. Do they more. downtown Seattle? I don't know if they do. Yeah, that they do have a website. I think it's called supersub.com. And they have their locations listed there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Perhaps this scanning machine that you have. Kind of similar to this guy that's hidden back here, actually, behind the monitor. It was a very simple one. It, it, actually, in, the one I use in my house every day is one we built. I designed, my stepfather built, because it's on a track. It rolls in, folds down, rolls in, I should say, and two closet doors close, and you don't know it's there. It's in my office. But the one I have that I bought is on the over my folks' house, and it's like this. One behind here. So I think it's, it's not a stand aid, but is it easy stand? I, think, I don't know the proper name of it, frankly. Maybe there's somebody that does. That's, I think that's stand aid. And it, it's very simple. It has a little hydraulic jack um, that just pumps, you know, braces the knee, strap underneath your your uh, butt, <laughs> cranks you up, right? And and for me, I need that chest brace when I get standing, like this one has over here. My feet go on the floor, though. I don't set them up on that, and I'm not mobile. You, you know. just have someone get you in it, and you just do that just to be in a standing position? I do, yeah. And for me, I did it for several reasons. One was, you know, it was started during my rehab at the UW. And I don't know if that's still part of the program today, but back then, if you could stand, they started you doing that. It helped your cardiovascular. It's good for your you know, psychological. Uh, Circulation, I thought, now there's some pooling to aspects, absolutely. You know, my feet will, will get more edema when I stand, particularly if I stand longer. Um, I notice that. And I get lightheaded if I'm standing. You know, if somebody gets caught up in something like 15 minutes, it becomes 20. I'm, they actually make a standing yeah. thing now that um, you can, it supports your knees so that it does all the it's takes your weight off and you can actually, if you have arm function, you can move your arms and then it will actually raise your legs too. So they do make them that you can kind of get on your legs. Get them on my um, there's different companies. Um, usually most of the therapists will know. That's if it's easy stand, it's by company, but um Well it's, uh salmon's uh, no, what is this? Salmon's Preston. Salmon's Preston and Rollins, and I don't know their yeah, email or their website. But they have a lot of equipment on that side. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I do stand every I try to, yeah. 15 minutes is my target. And I also find it's good for bladder and bowel function. Yeah. And spasticity. Like if I travel and I don't stand, boy, it's tough on my legs, tighten up a lot. But otherwise, I hardly have any leg spasticity. Yeah.
supposed to be good for all your organs? It has helped me. Yeah. I believe, yeah. You do have to be careful if there's a lot, if it's been a long, long yeah. time since yeah. you've been standing, though, because your bones can get pretty weak, and if you're not standing regularly, you could <laughs> fracture. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's just a, just a concern. Did you see that movie where this black comedian is in a wheelchair and he goes in the grocery store and he's, he's got armrests and he takes one out and gets stuff off the top shelf with it? I haven't seen it. So I, I tried it and I, it worked and right. I could get stuff off the top shelf. It's real interesting what happens when it falls down. Sometimes it hits me and sometimes it goes right <laughs> to the floor. I try to catch it in a yeah. mask. There you go. Yeah. Uh, but you don't want to do glass things. Yeah. Probably not. It's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to introduce our last speaker who's Todd, is it Stabelfeld or Stabelfeld? Stabelfeld. Stabelfeld. He's going to talk to us about vocal percussion. Yeah. Is that? I'll uh, raise up since you can see me a little bit. I was going to use technology. Chair only costs 34 grand, so I might as well use it. Oh, um, all right. Yeah. We need a drum roll, buddy. Yeah. It's, it's extremely embarrassing for me to do this, so um, we're actually all going to do it. And, uh, but the background, Todd, I'm a C4 quad uh, due to a, a horrific gunshot back in 87 when I was 8 years old. Stupid, playing with some guns. Um, complete C4 quad, the bullet actually entered my chin, uh, went through my throat and larynx and ended up severing the cord. Uh, it's a 22 rifle, still the bullet's all in there. If you take an x-ray of my neck, you'll see pieces of fragments all throughout my body um, of the bullet and whatnot. So that's at eight. In 87, rehab was way different back then. Uh, I grew up on a farm town. Exercise, nada, um, you know, uh, no money, uh, none of that stuff. And so, uh, you know, if you look at me uh, without a shirt on, most of you cry and run. Um, I sort of shaped like a Hershey kiss, um, which is sweet and not so sweet. At the same time, <laughs> but the amount of hair that I have on my chest makes me look a little bit bulkier, so that's good. <laughs> we'll, keep that, we'll keep that rolling. I do install the, the shoulder shrugs, you know, the typical, I, I, you know, I, I have my wall 150 a day. Do I do that? Sometimes, you know, when, when, you're, when it's a good day. And, uh, and so, I, you know, that's one thing that I do. I, I do the breathing things. I have a, a ventilator that I can wheel up to on my desk in my living room, which helps me expand my lungs so I can keep that going. I do a lot of singing. I'm not going to do that for you, uh, but I, I do a lot of church stuff, and so I find singing to be real, uh, real pleasure uh, as well as also an exercise piece. I find that if I'm wearing a abdominal binder, um, I, can, I can worship for the whole you know, 20 or 30 minutes. If I'm not wearing a binder, um, about every half to a whole song, I have to stop on the next song um, because I have to sort of catch up on my breathing. I work all the time. Uh, I don't sleep much. I have just a horrific schedule when it comes to those things. And so um, because of the money and all that, and I don't get any state assistance, I pay for all my caregiving. You know, I, I have to you know, live paycheck to paycheck like every other person here. And, and so I don't have the luxury to do the exercise machines uh, to get back and forth to do that. I live on Bay Ridge Island, so resources are a little bit different for me out there. So I do what I can uh, as much as I can. I do the whole nutritional thing as well, 180 pounds, uh, about 5 pounds overweight. Uh, it's difficult to lose weight, so you, again, you do whatever you can, where you can to maintain. My calorie intake, uh, I did have one of those nutritional tests. I can, my body only burns 833 calories a day, so good luck on, on an 800 calorie diet. Um, that's like a piece of cheese and a smile. So it's, it's very difficult to, to maintain the level of weight. Um, when I get really sick, I hate it, but I also love it because I lose a lot of weight. So um, I just got to the hospital a few weeks ago with a massive case of diarrhea uh, and vomiting, and I lost eight pounds. And so I was just really happy on that piece. Not the $10,000 bill that I got last week, but, you know, I did lose eight pounds, so eight pounds for 10 grand, you know, right on. But uh, for me, what I do is I do mouth percussion. It's called beatboxing. I'm not good at it. There's a lot of people that are way better than me. 
Uh, when you watch YouTube and Break.com, there's a lot of cool things happening. But I do what I can, and I also try to do a little rhythm to it. I try to incorporate shoulder shrugs, things of that nature. It's, it's fun. Uh, you know, it's just what I can do. And so, you know, I'll demonstrate for you folks. I try to do as many minutes as possible before you either pass out or get too dizzy. <laughs> so if you would just get your lips and lick them, um, to get them a little bit soft, and then just simply do a... You just, just one now. <laughs> okay, then you do like a little hi-hat, little... Okay, and then you do a little... <laughs> now you incorporate all that together, and then you do a little shoulder, you know, like that. And you sort of visualize you're in a club, you're single, single again, you know, you got a lot of stuff happening. And so uh, I just, I was trying to end real fast, and then my mouth gets dry. <laughs> song to go with it. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, I'm a big sort of musica fan, and if you have that in the background, you're able to do a little bit more. You know, I also, you know, you know I go in the living room and I, you know, I dance quite a bit, you know, but so if you got the music to go with it, you know, you can, you can go pretty good. How did you learn to do that? You know, it was the 80s, um, <laughs> and, uh, and it, was, it was a good time for a couple things. Um, Beatboxing was one of them, and cargo pants. And so, you know, I just did that. I wanted to be a cool bro in a chair. You know, I've always been a little bit more soul than uh, my counterparts, and, uh, and so that's always been something that I enjoy. So I just started practicing, and, and that was about it. And here recently, I sort of brought it back, you know, when I'm speaking, because sometimes people like to hear that. And it's also funny to see a quadriplegic do something like that, because Generally, you know, people don't associate beatboxing or hip hop with quadriplegia. So it's just something that I try to do to uh, lighten the mood in a crowd, but it also has, be, has been a health benefit as well. So, all right. All right. <laughs>